Once again, I'm Dr. Roberts. I'm joining you from the UK. If you're in the chat, tell us where you're joining us from. Um, and um, we'll make a start shortly. So welcome, welcome everybody. Okay, so today we today's lineup really is um, for us as um, children of Africa to get together and put our heads together, um, see how we can reframe um, the conversation around our beloved continent. Um, and so we have a couple of um, speakers. Um, we have people who have spent time, dedicated um, both time and resources into looking into the continent's problems and coming up with solutions um, that are viable and sustainable. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm excited to, to hear what some of um, my colleagues have to say uh, today. So without much further ado, I will um, introduce our first speaker. If you can hear me, um, just trying to make sure that you can hear me, just indicate that in the chat. Yeah, okay. So greetings from London, joining from Ghana. That's great. San Diego, California. Um, welcome, um, welcome to everybody. Uh, I've got someone from Austin, from Canada, from Philadelphia. Wow, um, greetings from the UK. Um, yeah, we're happy to have you here. Um, Liverpool, um, Juanita from San Diego, Oakville, Ontario, um, Philadelphia. So welcome. Um, wow, amazing, amazing. Okay, so um, should we make a start? Um, so what we want to do, I'll invite our first speaker on. So let's just give me a moment whilst i find um our introductions for our speakers yes we can hear you thank you juanita thank you so much um just bear with us peace to you too okay so should we should we make a start am i good to make a start all right, fine. Okay. So let's 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 make a start. So there'll be different speakers coming on um, to share their wisdom with us. Um, feel free at any point to um, put your questions in the chat, make comments. Um, we'll go through the comments. Make sure that um, your any questions. Uh, comments uh, are sort of noted. Um, so we'd really love your interaction uh, on this on this call. So um, okay, so let's make a start. Let's make a start. All right. Um, so today we've got um, five speakers. Um, I'll be anchoring um, the call with um, Mesrukam. We'll be hearing from um, people like Prof. George Elliott Clark, uh, Dr. Bumio Nintan, which who you all know, uh, Dr. Marcel uh, Bumalu, and um, Michael Omari um, from the YouTube channel Tuna Cheki. So I think we're all excited um, to have you on. Um, Mesrakam, shall I um, shall I get you? um to introduce yourself and then whilst you're doing that um we'll um give an opportunity for whilst dr uh, professor the professor is getting ready mesocam did you want to just give us a, a brief introduction and then uh, we'll go from there thanks thanks joseph yes. welcome everyone yes. welcome to our african brothers and sisters welcome also to our friends and allies and also people who are new um, to Africa, but who are interested and curious nonetheless. My name is Mescaramwale. 
Um, I also go by Mesky. Um, I'm a leader, founder, and innovator. Um, I've been in international politics for several years now. Currently, I'm initiating this movement for Africa, and we will be discussing a lot about that today. I'll be coming on later in the program to speak about the movement um, for our beloved continent. So yes, um, that's a bit about me. Yeah, so Mesker, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, but... Um, no, no, it's okay, because we usually know from text, not not in person. Yes, yes, I know. Um, but um, I'm so happy to have met um, kindred spirits like yourself. And thanks, Dr. Bumi, for uh, bringing us all together. I think you're doing an amazing um, job. Um, and your impact is... some. The, the beauty about um, the medium that we're using is that your impact goes well beyond your perspective. So you might not realize how far your impact is reaching because perhaps you don't get feedback from everyone who watches the channel. But I think the work that you're doing is vitally important because it's dealing with, with this, um, which, is, which is where probably our problems begin and where the solutions come from. So I'm really grateful uh, for the work that you're doing and also for the opportunity to uh, to join you and, and listen to wise heads on this call. So um, thank you. And, and I must also use this opportunity to acknowledge to not check his support, you know, in a, since we started the the channel, he, he kind of um, He's been he, he's mentored us in ways that you know you can't imagine. You know, even though he's a younger person, but he's more experienced in using the platform, and he's always been always willing to do whatever he can to kind of guide us, you know, so that we reach the audience that we reach. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, so digital media is um is the future, really. Um, and you I mean, we, we're seeing that now, uh, especially in the UK, most of our legacy media are now moving towards platforms like YouTube because the reach, and that's where the young people are, that's where the audience is. And so... He has over one point, about 1.5 million <laughs> subscribers. So yeah. he's really, really well established <laughs> in using <Yeah>. the medium. <laughs> well, you've got a good mentor. Um, you've got a way to go, but you're getting there. You're Thank getting you. there. <laughs> <laughs> Road to 100,000. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. No, Omar, Mr. Omar, it's good, it's good to... Uh, to finally um, meet you on, on the call and also thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, I'll tell you something, in our group, we, we do have a lot of people who share YouTube videos and yours tend to come up quite a bit. Um, there are other African YouTubers, but the focus is slightly different. Obviously everyone has their part to play in, in the niche and I think um, you're consistent in, in what you do. So. Don't stop, shall we say, don't, <laughs> don't stop. Um, okay, so Dr. Bumi, shall, I, shall we start to bring in, I wanted to bring in Professor. Yes, Professor uh, Yes, yeah, so Dr. Bumi, hi, Prof. Hello. <laughs> so honored to have you on the call with us. Awesome. Um, Good to be here. Yeah, I'm just waiting to just hear what you have to say and, and, and you know, pick your brains because uh, we do. <laughs> in Africa has so many problems and um, every time you try and engage intellectually with, you know, people even in my field. So just so an anecdote, we have people uh, in the diaspora who are really keen um, to, to help with the development of the continent. But one thing that, especially for those with families, one thing that is a hindering, a, a major obstacle is fears about health. And so we, we're trying to bring, uh, you know, a coalition of people who can, to try and find out how we can solve that problem. But the, the trouble is you speak to 
people who've been in the system and there's a lot of resignation. Oh, nothing can change. Um, our leaders are too corrupt. And so nothing ever gets done. And, and it, it's that sort of mentality, I think, that it's, is really preventing people who are really capable from coming together and starting a grassroots movement. Um, because we're always looking for a savior, um, someone outside of ourselves to, to really be the catalyst. Whereas I think we have capable people in the community who can at least put their hands to the plow and, and help be part of the solution. So I'd be interested to, to hear what you have to share on that front. But Dr. Bumi, since I, what I wanted to, you, I want two elders. I wanted, if you wouldn't mind, because you know Dr. Um, Clark, Professor Clark, a little bit uh, better than myself, if you wouldn't mind making the introduction for us, just because you'll be able to tell us a bit more about where his passions really are um, and what what we can look forward to. Well, where, where do I start? <laughs> a phenomenon like um, <laughs> Professor George Elliot Clark. Um, as far as I, I mean, as long as I've been in Canada, his name has resonated. Um, like we were saying before, um, I did not even know for a long time that he was from Nova Scotia, which I consider to be my spiritual home in Canada. But I was, I mean, I fell in love with his poetry um almost as soon as um, I got here and then I I he's he, he, he was um, the poet laureate for for the city of Toronto you know and then um, even before then I was you know always following him I mean he's a professor um, of English who has um you know taught him you know all the top-notch universities, <laughs> you know, in Canada and uh, and in the U.S. And um, honestly, I I can't do enough justice, you know, in this uh, brief introduction. But I also do know that to listen to him, you know, is to actually it, it's a privilege. To the, the, the way his mind works, you know, is something that I've I, I've, I've always admired, you know, and I'm just cannot wait to hear what he has to say to us today. Wow. Thank you, Professor Clark. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think that these are, are wonderful introductions to a very important international conversation that involves all of us on our beloved continent, as well as in the diaspora, which is global. Uh, as a result of European imperialism and, of course, uh, the slave trades, not only across the Atlantic, but up to the Arabian Peninsula from East Africa as well. Uh, and I have to begin by acknowledging the centrality of history to my thought uh, and my concerns and my worries. And, and I want to appeal to everyone who is listening to become deeply knowledgeable about your own national history, as well as the international history that has produced our uh, independent nations, at least politically independent nations uh, in Africa, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, the black majority or, or states with significant black populations in South America, as well as again in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, and and the extremely important uh, black minority populations, such as in the United States. And we need to be conversant with how our history connects us all and how we are all still dealing with the fallout of 500 years mm -hmm. of Western imperialism. I know it's an old fashioned thing to say now. A lot of people don't like to hear somebody talk about Western imperialism, but I'm 62 years old, born in 1960. And it's taken me a long time, actually, to come to accept that this is the determinant mode of world politics and world affairs. I, for a long time, like to think that that independent nations could afford to be independent and cut their own independent paths in the world. 
But uh, uh, as the apostle says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, but when I become a man, I got to put away the things of childhood. And so I put away those naive ideas about um, independence and international uh, and, the, and the international system and how we are all impacted by it uh, in many ways, uh, including in health, as Dr. Roberts has been, has been indicating or is very interested in discussing, as well as, of course, in the role that Africa plays on, on the world stage. But I also need to be specific, so I'm going to try to get specific. So let me say, first of all, when I use the phrase Western imperialism, what I really mean is white supremacy. Uh, I've come to understand uh, after a long time, again, many decades of thinking and thought and writing, I've come to understand that when the Western news media talks about the West, that's what they mean. They mean white supremacy. They don't actually simply mean Europe uh, and, and European satellites like Canada and the United States and Australia and New Zealand. Uh, these are all satellites. These nations are all satellites of Europe. And to a certain extent, so are some Asian nations like South Korea and, and Japan as a result of the consequences of the Second World War. Uh, these nations, in my personal humble opinion, have become integrated completely within a Western European, Western imperialist, white supremacist worldview, even though their populations are not necessarily Caucasian. Of course not. But nevertheless, they may end up reproducing policies that are supportive of a white supremacist view of the world, and I want to be I want to be generous to those who hold that point of view because they're absolutely right. They have benefited enormously from 500 years of European control, Western and Eastern European control of the entire planet in terms of economies, in terms of trade, in terms of resources, in terms of exploitation of resources, exploitation of uh, brains, of of labor power, etc. And, and I don't want to sound cynical, nor do I want to sound conspiratorial, but I do want to recognize that their histories, their own histories, tell us that they had a very good thing going up until the end of World War II and the beginnings of decolonization movements in, in uh, India, and of course, which became India and Pakistan, in Asia in general, the Middle East, uh, Africa itself, the Caribbean, and and how the and how uh, decolonization was actually resented and resisted, and and some persons were were deposed, some nations were destabilized. The West sent in its mercenaries or or its helpful fixers, so to speak, to dislodge uh, governments that were inimical uh, to what they saw as the best interests of a particular nation or nations, as well as, of course, their own best interests in terms of their corporations and so on. I think that the examples, everything I'm saying, I know I'm speaking very generally, but I think that the examples are very clear and evident and stark. Uh, it is amazing to me that, uh, for the most part, it is leaders, tyrants from developing nations or from the so-called third world who from time to time find themselves deposed and sent to sit in little glass boxes in The Hague. And that may be entirely appropriate. They should have to pay for their looting and their corruption and their massacres of their own peoples, as well as of others. I agree wholeheartedly. But then I wonder, why isn't President George W. Bush sitting in one of those glass boxes? Why isn't uh, uh, Henry Kissinger sitting in one of those glass boxes? These uh, personages of the West have also been responsible for atrocities have also been responsible for de for stimulating de facto genocides and exterminations of, of persons uh, and and for overthrowing governments of one sort or another or, or trying to overthrow governments of one sort or another around the world, basically breaking international law with impunity. And so I would ask my African brethren and sisters uh, to consider striking themselves, their own criminal court, for historical crimes against humanity. I think that's really important because we shouldn't allow folks in The Hague who represent white supremacy, represent Western imperialism, to be the ones always going running around the world pointing fingers at people about you're violating human rights, you're violating civil liberties, you are bad, you are evil. We are going to be the people who teach you a lesson, who bring you to justice, who force you to atone for your crimes and your sins, 
execute you, punish you, incarcerate you, whatever. And I think that that uh, developing nations, I think that the peoples of Asia and Africa and South America and Oceania need to put together our own criminal court with international reach, with our own judges applying UN regulations about who's responsible whenever war crimes or genocides uh, take place or whenever illegal acts against sovereign nations take place, especially when it's a Western nation against a, a non-Western nation, we need to have our own international criminal court to call those villains to account and to ask that they that their nation send them to, I don't know, our, our own version of The Hague. Maybe it's going to be in, in Cairo. Maybe it's going to be in Johannesburg. I don't know, but wherever it is, we should have the power to ask uh, guilty nations led by guilty leaders to send their leaders to our own little glass boxes for them to inhabit. And then we might have a fairer system of international justice and it might be less likely that richer nations will run roughshod over poorer nations while, it's, while arguing the whole, the whole time that it's about uplifting or protecting or defending uh, human rights. That's just one thing. So I wanna put that on the table. Let's have our own international criminal court for present and historical crimes against humanity. No one should be able to say that they are allowed to keep their ill-gotten gains, like Belgium, for instance, from the uh, what was then the Belgian Congo, by saying, well, that was then, it's all over. It's, you know, the great, great, great grandfathers committed all these crimes in the, in the Belgian Congo, locking off people's limbs stealing the diamonds and the rubber and cocoa and, and everything and, 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 uh, uh, and, and still trying to orchestrate things behind the scenes in terms of overthrowing Nkrumah, for instance, in the 1960s. And, and uh, we need to be able to call those, those empires, former empires, and their, and their constituent powers to account today because part of the wealth that they enjoy today was gained by essentially raping and pillaging Asia, South America, the Americas in general, and Africa. And we shouldn't pretend that just because it happened a century ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, that there's some kind of statute of limitations that has come to pass where we cannot talk about those past crimes because the proceeds of those past crimes are still making the, the, the descendants of the criminals rich and making them feel justified in holding on to their riches and then trying to pontificate to others who are still poor that it's their fault that they're poor. It's because they're lazy. It's because they're corrupt. I think that we would have a much better world system if in fact, along with that international court I've been, dis I've been discussing, that we actually pull up, put up rather, a hue and cry that is indomitable demanding reparations. The very idea that Western nations, again, white supremacist in history, and still today, white supremacist in attitude, that Western nations have the nerve to suggest that they don't have to answer for the transatlantic slave trade, they don't have to answer for depopulation of Africa, they don't have to answer for the warping of African uh, economies and, and divisions of African peoples in order to make themselves extremely rich and then to sit on that pile of gold and ivory to sit on on top of those heaps of uranium and cobalt and chrome and oil and say oh it's your fault that you are not as grandiosely rich and as militarily or earth shattering as we are even though we looted you and pillaged you for centuries and we're going to turn around and preach to you about human rights and civil liberties that we don't respect. Ask any indigenous person in Canada, ask any black person in North America, how much civil liberties, how much human rights we actually enjoy when we step outside of our homes or step outside of our apartments or step into our cars. Yes, we may have a good standard of living, but it doesn't mean that we are allowed to live our lives as citizens in these democracies without being harassed uh, to no end, almost from cradle to grave, by ignorant police and, and security guards and so on who are hell-bent on making us feel bad 
about being black when we only feel pride and, and only try to exercise our rights to go where we should be able to go so long as it's public property, to be able to buy where we can where we can afford to spend, be able to buy where we can actually be allowed to work. Uh, and so all this, I know I'm taking a lot of time to say all this stuff, but I'm also asking us to look through all of the baffle gab, to look through all of the propaganda. And we get propagandized all the time to think that certain nations are really good and always meant best for everybody, no matter what, while other nations are to be demonized and disrespected and dissed and so on as being failed states and as being uh, populated by second-rate examples of humanity. I think that we need to understand that the way that the world took shape first in 1492 and then in the Berlin conferences of 1884 and 1885 and then in the post-war conferences of World War I and World War II and especially World War II are responsible for the um, uh, colonizations, uh, for the severe extractions of human beings and labor uh, and resources uh, from countries that found themselves saddled uh, with the white supremacist, unashamedly, unabashedly white supremacist imperialist superstructure that was obvious and blatant about, we are oppressing you because you are people of color. You are less than human. So we feel we have a God-given right, God-given right to take whatever we want from you to do whatever we want to you, and you have no right to complain because we are bringing civilization, we are bringing Christianity. All you have to bring to us is your labor power and, of course, the resources that that uh, you will thank us uh, uh, tremendously for allowing us or letting us exploit the hell out of your God-given resources. So. Uh, uh, I say all this to try to push us to be constantly critical of the propaganda that we receive, to ask that we be extremely informed about our histories, to demand reparations for slavery, to demand reparation. I mean, you've got to think what was slavery? What slavery was is not just exploitation of, of labor without pay without any kind of compensation. It, was all, it also entailed the smashing of families. It entailed the smashing of nations. This was a crime against humanity. I don't care that 500 years have gone by. I don't care. It is still a crime against humanity that has never actually been, where, where those responsible have never actually been called to account. And then they have the nerve to talk about other people being violators of human rights and civil liberties. I don't believe that anyone in the West has any right to talk about crimes being committed by anybody else until they atone for their crimes against indigenous people and against African peoples brought here against their will to make them rich. And, you know, okay, I'm not a theorist of, of global politics, but I am a student of history. And I do not, I just do not understand how anyone can overlook these blunt and brutal facts about the constitution of this planet since 1492 and the other dates that I've mentioned, which simply saw a reinforcement of, of centuries old practices of white supremacy. Uh, I know I'm supposed to be speaking for 20 minutes. I'm not sure if I have spoken for 20 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if I, if I should be stopping and asking anyone for any questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I, if I should turn to a poem or two or what have you. I'm not even sure that I've answered Dr. Roberts' questions about, about health uh, and so on. Although I think it's interesting that in the recent uh, and ongoing COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there has not been to my knowledge much discussion about uh, setting up uh, an industry in Africa where Africans could themselves produce uh, the vaccines needed as opposed to having to go to, to world producers and ask them to 
uh, present that that bounty of life-saving uh, medicines. So I'm not going to venture very far in that direction because I'm just not very well versed in in the histories of healthcare and so on. So I, I think I'll I'll pause here and just ask if uh, there's anything else I might be able to comment on. No, thank you, Professor. Um, you make some really salient points. Um, I just just want to come back to the really important point you made about. Um, moral superiority in the sense that we've allowed the Western world to, I guess, frame the moral debate, um, define what it means to be right, what human, what constitutes human rights abuses. Um, and Africa seems to have been completely left out of that dialogue. I guess the question would be, your solution or the idea of setting up criminal courts um, with international reach <clears throat> with our own judges it's 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 a challenge because you'll have people who obviously uh, are lawyers and some of our judges are trained in sort of that western paradigm so how do we go about, in, in your view, how do we go about circumnavigating that? Um, because each time we try to do something like this, there's subterfuge, subterfuge um, there's sabotage. Um, so it'd be interesting to maybe um, hear how you think we could go about um, something as fundamental as that, because the, the very idea of good and evil is tied into in my view, um, as he said, the dehumanization of Africans that was necessary um, to justify things like the slave trade. Uh, it's a great question. And, and um, you know, I can't pretend to know how exactly uh, the architecture of such a court would work or what it would constitute or what would help to constitute it. But I can say this that I do believe is important that we reach notions of justice through debate, through egalitarian debate, as opposed to having a top-down uh, discourse that says, we're always in the right, you're always in the wrong. Uh, don't tell us about our historical misdeeds. We just want to tell you about what we think you're doing wrong today. I think that in order for us to have a truly egalitarian justice system, we need to have the balance of the vast majority of humanity, and we got to remember, uh, you know, look, I'm not into numbers. Everybody has, a, you know, it's just, it's, it's, numbers are not important, but I do think it's, it is interesting to recognize that 15% of the world's population controls the vast majority of the world's resources, mm. backed up with extreme military might. Given that fact, how can we pretend that that 15% of the world is somehow because they have the, uh, the most of the wealth and the vast majority of the military power, that that somehow makes them morally more just or morally more correct than the rest of humanity, which is the vast majority of us, I'll say. I think that in order to ensure that there is real justice amongst all parts of the world and all peoples of the world, then the vast majority of the planet, which consists of people of color, we need to have our own uh, courts that are able to interact, not necessarily overrule, but interact with other courts to determine where justice and injustice really lie, and to bring into uh, and bring into the court record whatever historical evidence is necessary to be produced. And we can do that. We can produce that. I agree that, that what I'm asking, what I'm suggesting is difficult, but then so was setting up the United Nations difficult. And so, and, and so has also the United Nations been in some ways, in some cases, a great disappointment, as well as being a great success from time to time in some areas. I think that if there was a, an international court for historical and present day crimes against humanity, that would actually bother to represent the 85% of the, of the world that is not resident in Europe or its satellite states, uh, that we have a much better chance of achieving 
real uh, regimens of justice as opposed to, again, the kind of top-down system that we have now. Um, I believe that if there are truly persons of goodwill all over, uh, then we ought to be able, to, no matter how no matter how uh, jurists are trained, no matter whether they come from a Western paradigm or some other paradigm, we can always have more than more than one set of judges for any court. Anyway, we can have judges from very different uh, uh, frameworks of, of, of philosophical and even theological opinion sit in judgment on particular cases. I think that would be really good for humanity if we were able to enlarge. Uh, the the uh, 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 the, uh, the the basis upon which uh, international judgments would be made, uh, and so I think that despite whatever difficulties there will be in establishing such a such a court, we need to do it so that we can avoid situations that we have ongoing right now, where, for instance. Uh, 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 African nations are are saying in some cases we refuse to recognize the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, and partly because of the of the perceived bias that always the miscreants are people of color, always the miscreants are from uh, the developing world, and occasionally the miscreants were formerly backed by Western powers until they fell out of favor. And then they got deposed and sent to the Hague. This is this is uh, a shell game of diabolical uh, uh, proportions. And I think in order to smash that, in order to make an international court actually seem just, it has to represent more than in, more than simply Western interests, which is what we've got right now. Yeah. yeah. No, thank, thank you, thank you for, for that. that. Um, um, so I think. So 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 much to unpick, um, so much to unpick there. But I, I wanted to perhaps use this opportunity to bring in um, Dr. Bumi um, to to just hear what she has to say, um, her comments uh, and reaction to some of your thoughts um, and some of the solutions you've proposed. But. Um, there's just so much to unpick here. We could talk about this for quite some time. I, it's, um, it's uncanny um, because he and I did not discuss, you know, our presentations. And I'm just seeing how some of the things I raise, you know, um, might maybe throw some light on some of the things he's, um, he's also raised. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. At some point, I mean, one of the reasons why I came up with this topic is that I also know that at some point, we nobody's going to hand anything over to us. Reparations, equality, global citizenship, nobody's going to hand it over to us. We have to strategize, you know, and then grab what is rightfully ours. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on in my paper, yeah. in my presentation. So. Um, Alatunde, please, can I have my slides? Can I have my first slide? Okay. Um, but before I go on, I'd like to thank everybody for making the time to join us, especially subscribers of um, uh, Sankofa Pan African series. It's your support that has kept this going. We, um, we've had no support from anywhere, but the very fact that you people even take the time to subscribe, to watch, is what has um, uh, kept the, the channel going. And thank all my friends, family, colleagues from all around the world who have taken the time to be a part of this uh, uh, summit. Um, yeah, let's, let me have the second slide. I So my... my Ideally, um, global citizenship should mean that every person is an equal citizen of the world. And quite apart from our common humanity, it should also refer to the fact that whether or not we are aware of it, major decisions and actions, whether social, political, environmental or what have you taken in one part of the planet affect people living in different um, uh, parts of the world 
and I and, and you can see that from the issues raised by uh, Professor Clark. Next slide, please. Now, um, when we understand what global citizenship is supposed to mean, it should be easier for us to unwrap what it means to be global African citizens. As global Africans, we must be aware of and understand that, uh, understand our place in the wider world. We should also be aware that it is not enough to take active roles in our communities, but that the survival, the very survival of our communities and the success of our activism depend on actions and decisions being taken in other places. And that it is our responsibility to look out for how those decisions affect us and future generations of Africans, wherever we may be. We, nobody is an island. Next slide. Um, the concept of globalization is, of course, not new. No matter how hard its proponents work to convince us that it is a new panacea to help the developing world. Globalization started with the European colonization of the Americas, like Professor Clark uh, pointed out. Uh, colonization of the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Think about it. When modern colonization began by mercenaries like Columbus and others, who have been whom, whom we have been led to believe. Whom we have been uh, people whom we have been led uh, uh, led to believe were explorers who were actually being financed by their monarchs to go and look for resources to save their impoverished kingdoms in Europe. What were they doing? Replace human cargo with natural resources today, and the connection is quite clear. Countries in Europe simply took advantage of the abundance of resources found in other territories. And in ways similar to the kind of mayhem with those early European operators of globalization wrought in the territories in which they ravaged, violence, starvation, corruption, are the order of the day now in the developing world. Even as we remain conned into believing that globalization is a recent concept, and that trade liberalization will help our development in spite of the accelerating decrease in quality of life in the developing world. I mean, look at what's happening in Haiti today. My point here is not to condemn the notion of a globalization. I believe it is harmful, you know, because only a section of the world seems to have this kind of vision that allows them to exploit the resources of this earth at the expense of the rest of us. Globalization, which is supposed to be the process by which organizations develop international influence or operate on an international scale, is obviously driven by the economics and the political interests of the economic North. While globalization is uh, supposed to open the flow of products, capital, people, and information, it has so far been a one-way traffic in the sense that while it has more readily opened up avenues to more wealth and the advantages of global citizenship for people from the economic north, the same access has been increasingly denied people from the economic south. If anything, Rather than help entrench the idea of global citizenship, globalization has been responsible for even more uneven development because of the continued exploitation of resources from um, underdeveloped countries by developed countries. It has undermined the ability of citizens from the economic south to aspire to any form of equal global citizenship. And those of us from developing countries in Africa and the Caribbean and other places are fully aware that we cannot just wake up 
and decide that we want to exercise our rights as global citizens by going on holiday or even visiting family in almost any part of the economic north without the hassles that attend gaining entry to such places. I'm not even talking about, um, about uh, economic migration here. Often, the fact that you can afford to pay your own way is no longer relevant because of the level of gatekeeping that most countries in the economic north have been forced to put into place because most of our countries in the economic south are hardly life-sustaining. A situation which has continued to be exacerbated by the widening of the economic gap caused by the global economic infrastructure that has been skewed to favor rich countries at the expense of developing ones. Is it therefore any wonder that uh, most young people in the economic South faced with an abysmal uh, future are bent on migrating to greener pastures? Nigerians have a colorful way of describing this. And trust us, <laughs> um, Nigerians describe this wave of forced economic migration um, in, in a very colorful way. And really, can we blame anyone for wanting to japa? Literally translated, japa means to migrate by any means necessary. The ability to migrate move from one place to another for better economic opportunities is as old as human beings have been on this earth. And in an ideal world, it should be one of the gains of global citizenship. And which globalization is supposed to, um, um, to give us. Global citizens should have the opportunity to move around the globe of which we are all supposed to be free and equal citizens. However, this very notion is, a, is utopian. That is why we find shiploads of human beings trying to make their way to Europe in search of better opportunities being turned back on the high seas. In the same manner, large bands of people from Central and South America uh, Southern America, who are forced by poverty and become bent on making their ways into the US, are met by all kinds of visible and invisible fences and threats to build even higher walls. A phenomenon which we all know then led to the Americans electing a not quite mentally stable man as president of the so called leading uh, country of the free world. The point I'm trying to make is that the ideal of globalization is um, it, it becomes has grown increasingly elusive to, to, to most of the world, which is why the idea of global African citizenships should be one which appeals to us. There isn't just strength in uh, there isn't just strength, but also wisdom in numbers. Uh, my next slide, yes, yeah, yeah, that's correct slide. Now, um, before I try and encapsulate what I believe global African citizens should entail, let me try and unpack what I conceive as the relationship between Pan Africanism and global African citizenship. At its inception, Pan-Africanism started from uh, as movements um, that were dedicated to establishing independence of African nations and the cultivation of a unity among black people throughout the world. And uh, behind the, its evolution, was uh, the idea that peoples of African descent have common interests and should be unified. Historically, Pan-Africanism has often taken the shape of a political or cultural movement for independence of countries. I like to situate global African citizenship 
as a natural offshoot of Pan-Africanism in the sense that now that our countries are independent, at least on paper, global African citizenship should propel us as citizens of whatever country or countries we find ourselves on this earth, committed to advancing the notion of equality within and beyond our national borders. I say countries because some of us are citizens of more than one country. Global African citizenship should make us continue to engage our local challenges while situating them within global context. In other words, global African citizenship should help us connect the dots better as political, climate, youth, feminist, race, disability activists, or whatever other kind of activism we are engaging in. Global African citizenship should keep us always cognizant of the bigger picture by linking our local situations with global connections. Why do some of us who are in diaspora expend so much energy trying to combat racism within our national borders, but cannot see it as an evil which has been allowed to cross borders unfettered because we refuse to see how ingrained race is within the global economic architecture and power structures. And uh, I think Prof did a great um, job, you know, linking this. And let me borrow um, and expand the clarion call that was raised by some of the earliest black feminists to warn their white middle-class uh, sisters. Until all people of African descent are free of oppression and seem to be equal to all other people, none of us, none of us will be free. So global African citizenship should strengthen us so that we do not readily continue to concede the evolution of values, um, solutions to our problems and assumptions about us to the sometimes overwhelmingly well-meaning activists from the economic north. Activists who are well-meaning, but always have the comfort of the fact that they are natives and I use the word native here deliberately, of regions that have far-sighted leaders who are even already seeing beyond this planet that they are extending, uh, expending so much on exploring space for the benefits of their kind, countries or regions. Meanwhile, the majority of Africans and people of African descent in the Caribbean um, and other parts of the, of the diaspora are grappling, handicapped by the very need to stay alive. To illustrate, when I sent um, the invitation to this event to a highly respected activist in Nigeria, one who for decades has been at the forefront of working to entrench democracy, good governance, human rights, academia, what have you, in Nigeria. His response to me was, and, 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 and I quote, thanks for sharing from someone who has been handicapped by his country to aim at the global. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay, yeah. So to start with, a global African citizen, to my mind, is one who does not shy away from embracing Africa's past in all its glory and goal. Like I've said elsewhere, nobody's ancestors were perfect. The ability to embrace and admit the role that some of our ancestors 
played alongside those who plundered us can only help us to understand the psyche of our overwhelmingly irresponsible political class today and how to effectively challenge them. Global African citizenship should also help us to free ourselves of the shackles with the global north and their transnational corporations continue to rot in collusion with their partners in the economic south to keep us oppressed we need to embrace our history good or bad actually it's both good and bad we will and if we do so it will help us to recognize that there is a pattern at play arab and European enslavers and colonizers would not have succeeded in enslaving and colonizing us without the collusion of some of our ancestors who were very often the traditional rulers and merchants who made their wealth through those odious uh, trades. Right now, the economic South is in cahoots. I mean, sorry, the economic North is in cahoots with our political elites. The difference is that rather than being shackled and carted across the Sahara or abroad across the ocean, we are shackled and kept prisoners within our countries to be exploited by the economic north through multinationals who callously continue to exploit our resources under the watch of our irresponsible political um, elites and their cronies, some of the unlucky ones who try to escape still end up facing death on the high seas or in the Gulf region as modern slaves. Next slide. Uh, please bear with me. I'm, 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 uh, so, next slide. Yeah. How do we move forward? We must reconcile our past. The ethnic rivalries that made us vulnerable to religious, economic, and political exploitation by all comers are still very much with us today. Unearthing our history by ourselves, not the versions that are being fed to us by our exploiters, would only help us to know where we went wrong and how to avoid making the same mistakes over and over again. Like the prof said, it's good to situate ourselves in history. The making of amends. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where was I? Yeah. yeah. So it would help us to know where we went wrong and how to avoid making the same mistakes over and over again. Knowing our history will help us avoid uh, making the same mistakes over and over again. And the making of amends for our role in slavery is only one aspect of that process of introspection, but it is a crucial step if we are to make any headway as global Africans. Um, yeah, next slide. Making amends for slavery does not have to be monetary. Since first, African countries are, of course, some of the poorest in the world, because the wealth, again, like Professor Elliot, uh, Elliot Clark said, uh, the wealth made from slavery was used to build other continents and not Africa. However, amends still have to be made. We can't get away from it. We need to make amends for the part that we play, played in slavery and slave trade. Because the wound that our role inflicted on those who were carted away was more psychic in that we were also hurt. We, are, we hurt ourselves you know, by the roles that we played in the slavery. And um, the result of that wound that we inflicted 
and not just our kids and kin who were taken away, but that we also inflicted on ourselves is apparent today in the mess that the continent is in. We remain so easily exploitable today because we do not see how like in the past, we are complicit in our own destruction. Okay. Now, offering apologies to those who were taking, opening up our borders uh, to them, reinstating their rights to choose to return if they want. These are only some of the you know, things that we need to do. We must, next slide, we must reinstate their rights to choose to return. And by doing these so-called these things that might look, you know, small, we will not only be making amends, but we will start a process of healing ourselves. I know a few African countries are already doing this, but we all must do so, not as a, as the kind as as if not as a, as if we're doing them a, a favor by granting them the right to return if they choose to unfettered. But we should be doing so as acts of contrition. Because making amends will only strengthen us. And as Africans, if we're serious about demanding and getting reparations for slavery and colonization, then such demands can only be taken serious if we own our own parts and are seen to be making reparation for it. Another thing that it would do is it would take away, it would undermine the um, excuse usually given, you know, by the colonizers and the enslavers that it was so long ago, you know, for them to be able to make um, reparations. If we are seen to be doing, if we are able to do it now, why can't they? So um, to round up, I really do believe that if we're being pragmatic, we will accept that global African citizenship, like globalization, should be driven by identity and values. It's not, it's not an accident that the poorest people in the world are people of darker skin color. Global African citizenship should not only be about how we all share a common humanity, but should underscore our equal worth. It should mean being open to engaging positively with various identities and cultures and being able to recognize and challenge stereotypes. It is unquestionably about how we use and share the earth resources fairly and the entrenchment of the most basic of our human rights. Rights to life, liberty, freedom, um, free of slavery, the right to work and the right to education, all of which most of us of African descent are currently being denied as global citizens. Global African citizenship should help us explore the complexity of the global issues that deny us these rights. Um, the last slide, um, I just want to end by leaving a few uh, questions. Go to the last slide. So how do we as global Africans commit to build our understanding of world events and how they affect us, our continents and our diaspora? How do we get involved in not just our local and national but global African communities so that we can act effectively to influence the world around us? The world should not, not just happen to us, we should be affecting it. We should be affecting, you know, affecting the world. How does global African citizenship inspire and inform us as parents, teachers, um, community members, leaders? So our young ones are taught the power of their voice from an early age, and that they must insist on using this power to build a fairer, safer, and more secure world for themselves and everyone else. And uh, so how do we work to entrench the rights to demand that what has been taken from us should be returned or compensated? 
how do we protect and explore our resources for our own development? Thanks for, for listening. Thanks, Dr. Bumi. Um, that, that's quite something. Um, global African citizenship. So this is the, um, I, I like what you said about it being an offshoot of uh, Pan-Africanism and obviously rooted in identity and um, shared values, especially that of equal worth. There were a couple of questions as you were speaking that people were um, wanting to, um, I guess, sort of uh, ask or maybe get some clarification. And some of that was this, um, in terms of the idea of contrition, um, the because this is a sensitive topic. I know. Uh, especially if you're talking about Africa's role in in this in the especially the transatlantic slave trade, um, just people it, it's it's quite a sensitive topic. How and I know that I think there some of the tribes around the coastal areas of, of Ghana where the, um, the 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 slave dungeons were um, have actually offered some kind of apology during yeah. Ghana's year of return. Yeah. Yeah. But the point to make is important that if we are really contrite, then why not open up unfettered citizenship to those who were wronged, who we wronged as Africans on the continent? Because brothers and sisters in the diaspora are there because we must have been complicit. And even if we weren't um, overtly complicit, there were system failures that allowed the exploitation to happen, which I don't think we've really addressed. We um, so where where would we start? I mean, on an individual level, that's different. But I'm talking about as a as a community, how do we go go about this healing process? I think, like they, like you rightly said, countries, some countries like uh, Ghana, and them. Um, have actually acknowledged even I think maybe Gambia, a few countries have, but this is something that it, all of us must do. And then can you imagine teaching history to our kids, pointing to the role that some of our traditional leaders and merchants played, you know, in how, you know, what happened to us happened. And then those kids growing up to be people who are able to link what is happening today with our irresponsible political class and the way in which they are allowing transnationals to run, you know, riot over our resources. It, it, it's, it's, it's a two-way thing. The apology is not just an act. It's, a, it's something we need to heal ourselves. We deceive ourselves. You know, if we keep lamenting, oh, we have poor political leaders. I mean, look at what is going on in Nigeria today. But we're not able to link it, you know, to, to none, a lot of us don't actually know that the irresponsible politician, political class that we have today, they're not new. They are following in the footsteps of some others who cost us so much. And that to let them continue would be to just keep digging us deeper and deeper into poverty and the kind of oppression and the kind of futurelessness that is driving our young ones in droves to risk their lives, you know, trying to cross, I mean, in a weird reversal mm -hmm. of the Atlantic slave trade. We are the ones that are willing to go and die on the high seas. Imagine, you know, those in those watery graves, how, you know, how sad they must be before they are able to actually see what, what we are doing to ourselves. It's all connected. Yeah. So much, so much to unpick, um, so much. But you're right that our problems are rooted in our history. And just yeah. as uh, Professor said, just to, to begin to understand and to come up with solutions to Africa's problems. Um, we need to be rooted or situated. Everything has to be situated in our history. 
So, Dr. Bumi, we can talk about this for like this. This whole conversation could go on for a whole day, and, and but let me um because there are others waiting, and then at the end, I think people are still asking more questions, but we'll try and address some of those as as we go along. Um, but let's bring in your young mentor, as you said. <laughs> um, My favorite YouTuber. Yes, yes. <laughs> bring in Omari. Mr. Yes. Tunacheki, yes. thank you so much um, for your patience. But we now we, I hand over to you to make some comments um, because you're on the ground, you're dealing with what's happening on the continent you're dealing with young people not just young people but your platform obviously has such a wide reach what 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 really does it mean now i mean i guess from my point of view it's easy for me to see how the rise of technology has made it easier to be a global african um information flows has made it easy for people to be aware of what's really happening on the continent. Viral TikTok, um, YouTube videos, just make it easy for us to maybe share um, things that I guess are pertinent um, to us. So I'll, I'll hand over to you from in your experience, from, what, from your vantage uh, standpoint, what are you seeing on the continent? And is there really a movement happening uh, do you think things are changing? Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pick it up from uh, where you just uh, left it off because uh, we are in this new information age. Uh, we are just about to start it. We haven't technically left the industrial age. We are just stepping in to the information age. And as, as uh, have, have you said, how is a continent using this new technology, using this new, uh, new age? Uh, so is this new technology a tool uh, that will enable Africans or a weapon that will be used against Africans? Uh, this will be part of my presentation, but uh, a good example is, uh, you've said uh, these days people uh, go on TikTok, people go on, um, people go on YouTube, uh, but did you know uh, TikTok is made in China, right? TikTok in China, only accepts educational content for their kids, right? No dancing, no memes, no challenges. If it's not educational, like, like the content is kicked out. So compared to how Africa, even if we have the ability to regulate content like that, right? Where a 14 year old just gets all manner of, of content. So is this new technology being used as a weapon against Africans or is it, will Africans use it as a tool to educate uh, new uh, new youths uh, like uh, yeah, the young to enable uh, people to share uh, uh, more and use this technology. So that will be how I will how we'll start it off. So to begin with, uh, this is a good representation of the faces of Africa, right? Uh, represents so many young, old, uh, the new generation, uh, our, like us, uh, the current generation, and uh, and uh, let's start. Let's see what we have. I'll just move step by step. So the question of the day is, uh, what does it mean to be a global African today? Right. So today, what this means is to be connected. Uh, you are in a different continent, uh, thousands of kilometers away. Uh, I'm in a different continent, in a different country, but we're connected. I'm talking to you like you're next to me. I'm talking to Dr. Bumi, like uh, she's just uh, ne next to me. So uh, this new technology has brought about change in the world and uh, to the detriment of the people who invented it, right? Uh, like, you know, with any new technology, you never know how it's going to be used. Uh, so the people who used it uh, made it for war, right? Uh, you know the history of how the internet came to be, right? Uh, it was just like a tool uh, for uh, uh, these uh, supercomputers to communicate with each other, right? And uh, the technology morphed to something that it's 
really hard to control these days. Uh, they're trying, as you've seen the recent um, activities and drama with Twitter, they're really trying to uh, to control this new technology, but it's unleashed. And uh, how will Africans use it? So let's continue. So the information age. Uh, Africa, we, we were very successful during the Stone Age. Uh, we were very successful during the Bronze Age, uh, the Iron Age. Uh, uh, where we made, uh, like, uh, we established kingdoms, uh, we had riches, spanned uh, thousands of kilometers, uh, like the famous Songhai, Songhai kingdoms, Egypt, like, we really did well in this age. Where we faltered was the industrial age, where uh, the West came, took everything we had, took everything, took all uh, uh, our raw materials, took developed their countries, right? Uh, so uh, now, uh, that was just a small span of uh, 500 years. Now we have an, a new chance in this new age that we're approaching, the information age. How will Africans tackle this uh, age? Will it just be another, uh, another um, opportunity to be exploited, right? Will it be another opportunity for us now to take this age and elevate ourselves as Africans? Because uh, uh, what got us during the industrial age was the divide and conquer. Uh, we were so fragmented, sp uh, like um, uh, split apart, uh, fighting tribes. So I think about it, you've been having this uh, tribe uh, stealing your cows for uh, like maybe uh, uh, the past hundred years, right? Then this white man comes and say, hey, you know, if you sell those guys, I'll give you money. So first, your problem is being solved. Second, you're getting something on top. So uh, some things just happened based on necessity, not based on ill, Ill, like Ill malice or greed, just opportunity. If you're divided, you're, it's so easily. So now we have this tool uh, that will bring this global African uh, citizenship together where it doesn't matter where you're from, if you're from Morocco, if you're from South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, we're just one global African or also plus the diaspora where we, we speak as one voice, right? If it's, uh, if it's, one, like if it's an issue, we, we are all together to tackle that issue. And that is the future of a global African citizenship. Okay, so what is the next step? Then is it a tool? So, for like uh, for most of you who who uh, don't know, Western media uses uh, media information as a weapon. They've been doing that ever since it's been established. Uh, J.K. like J.K. Rowling's, uh, the former president of Ghana, once said, uh, like this is the best quote I think uh, he's ever said. Like he said. Uh, the West is like a sandwich where the government is on top, the media is in the middle, and the bottom is the uh, uh, like security services. Uh, like those are the CIAs, the FBIs, right? The top, the government's job is to manage the middle and the bottom, right? The middle is to pacify, misinform, control the people, and the bottom, the security services, is not to do the dirty work. If somebody is not cooperating, you, you know, uh, a coup, an assassination, uh, a toppling here and there, right? So this sandwich is what West, the Western world has been using to control the world, right? And uh, uh, as, as, as a background uh, for me, uh, uh, like before journey, uh, starting to Nacheki, I used to work uh, at, the, at, like at the UN. Uh, I was so young, naive. Uh, I thought uh, w the place where you, you're going to change the world is the United Nations, right? Uh, like I was like, yeah, all this uh, war, all this disease, all this hunger, like this is where, like if you want to change the world, this is where to be. And uh, after two years, I realized why the United Nations was made, the purpose of the United Nations. The purpose of the United Nations in general is to keep the status quo, to keep the world as it is, to keep the uh, Security Council members, the top five uh, uh, countries, the Western countries, 
and uh, Russia and China happy, right? Keep them happy and uh, stop them from going to World War Three, because the um, United Nations was formed after World War Two, right? And uh, their job was to prevent another catastrophic world war. And their job currently, uh, if if I would say they're doing a good job, uh, there hasn't been another world war, right? As, as we can say, we are we live in a relatively peaceful world, right? So, uh, like the purpose of the United Nations is currently. Uh, happening. Uh, so for those uh, of uh, you Africans who think the United Nations is here to help you to, to, uh, to change the world uh, that we live in, no, no, that's not the purpose. And the more you start thinking uh, in this new kind of uh, thinking, uh, this new kind of way, is the more you'll be better ready for the information age. So uh, let's continue. And this comes to my next point. Our world, your world, right? So, um, like every time you hear like global citizenship, uh, you hear um, let's uh, like uh, this this world that we live in, uh, let's like uh, let's save uh, the world from climate change. It's usually their world, the Western world, as uh, as uh, uh, the good uh, uh, professor said, uh, the 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 white world, the white supremacy world. We live in a world that the white supremacy is won. We are under the yoke, we follow their rules, we abide by uh, the laws they give, we try to survive, right? And uh, in this new age, it's our only chance, this new information age, it's our only chance to get out from those shackles, right? So uh, I'm advising every African to these days, start thinking about your world. When you're watching uh, the BBCs and the CNNs, and uh, they're trying to be inclusive, or or or, or they're reporting, uh, they're reporting as if we live in a fair and just world. Just know that's their job, right? Their job is to pacify uh, the masses. Their job is to make those people in the West feel about themselves, right? Uh, so, 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 uh, like think about it. Uh, most stories. Uh, or on Africa that was the Western media portrays are usually negative. And even the little positive they do, they are most likely always patronizing, right? Uh, or uh, like uh, uh, these doctors are, are like using recycled, uh, I don't know, like recycled like syringes or like, some, like extremely patronizing uh, stories meant to still keep Africa further down, uh, make make the West look and feel good about themselves. Uh, that's the purpose of the media. And now what uh, are Africans doing about it, right? What are this global citizenship of Africans going to do about it? So we live in an age where we can now control the narrative. We all can tell our own stories and uh, and uh, uh, like uh, the reason I left the UN to start to Nacheki is so that uh, like the world would see Africa through my lenses, right? Uh, I, I was tired of listening to BBC, to CNN, to Al Jazeera telling me uh, there's war uh, like in Addis Ababa. Well, I'm in Addis Ababa, I'm not seeing any war. I'm like, hey, what's like, what's the mathematics here, right? So, uh, and my challenge is uh, for, for us, uh, like for me, I, I, I did it full time. Uh, we've been uh, relatively successful. We have uh, uh, over 1 million subscribers. We have over a quarter of a billion uh, views uh, so far and still, and still growing. But that is okay. But you know what's better? On my final point, is uh, yeah. one million pan African creators challenge, right? So uh, what's better than having a million subscribers is having a million tunachikis, having a million Dr. Boomies, right? Having a million people telling our own stories. There's no way they can drown us. Uh, right now, if uh, the powers that be uh, are tired with uh, like what Tunachik is doing, they're like, ah, these guys are exposing 
us too much. It's so easy for them to close our YouTube channel, our TikTok, our uh, our Facebook, our Instagram. It's so easy because we do not own that platform. Really, like we still don't own our own African-made uh, platform. But if there are like a million or two million or ten million Africans, Africans on the continent, Africans in the diaspora, right? Doing what I'm doing, what Dr. Boom is doing, sharing uh, knowledge, uh, like uh, like, and, and then uh, it's not a must for you to be all political, uh, to to report the news, to do historical content. Uh, you, like there's entertainment, there's uh, like there's, there's music, uh, there's pop culture, there's uh, there's science. There's so many genres that Africans need to tell, uh, uh, like from the perspective, right? So uh, that is the challenge uh, I'd wish for a million or more Africans, Pan-African, to do what we are doing so that the voice, uh, like we can have one voice and we can drown this information, all the patronizing uh, content, all the racism. And uh, for once, if we have a goal, uh, we can achieve it because we are all in unison like we're all in use, uh, like in unison, which makes uh, a globe, right? Uh, we are all together and uh, we can have the same message. Uh, and uh, uh, with that said, uh, I'm open for any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Omari. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, we do have to tell our own stories. I think the people in the comments really echoing with that sentiment. Um, and yeah, we must do both, right? Tell our own stories, um, decolonize our minds. Yeah, um, I, I know that there are there is some work going on um, tr trying to create our own platforms. I, so that work is ongoing. I think as people do recognize that need. Um, so glad to report that that is uh, that work is ongoing. So before we introduce our next speaker, I wanted to invite Dr. Soti Mirren um, to come and um, share a poem with us. Um, part of, as you mentioned, part of telling our own stories is using, you know, the creative media, um, telling things from our own perspective. So um, without much further ado, I'll bring on Dr. Uh, Suti Mirin to come and um, share a, a poem with us. Okay. So Tunde, do we have Dr. Suti Mirin on? Okay, so whilst we're getting um, Dr. Ready, um, Tunacek, I just wanted to um, just read a couple of um, comments as you were speaking. Um, so really, how, how are you, so this, this uh, challenge of starting one million creators. How 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 do you envisage that going? How are you starting that? Who, how how so, how's that going to get off the ground? Yeah, yeah. so uh, we uh, we started two years ago. Uh, we created um, a platform called Friends of Tunacheki because uh, uh, we are uh, a bit established. Uh, so what we do is that we help any creator. Uh, by help, we mean we give knowledge. Uh, we promote uh, their channel. We have one-to-one -one discussion on uh, how to be uh, successful uh, on YouTube, how to promote uh, like your, your, your content, how to uh, soft test you. So we give this technical knowledge for free. We've never charged for any 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 of this knowledge, as uh, Dr. Bumi has said. And uh, we've uh, quite uh, we we brought up a huge community, and uh, we are slowly building. So the information is there online. We are here to help any creator, and when I mean any creator, is that it's not a must for you to uh, to be like, hey, I want to quit my job and start a YouTube channel or start my own platform. No, no, you can be a doctor, start making content about uh, 
medicine, uh, like in, like uh, like uh, just medicine from an African perspective. That's so much content that's needed, right? Uh, a small kid somewhere would see, hey, there's this uh, Ghanaian doctor who's was very interesting. You know, I'm going to be a doctor, then also be a YouTuber. You know, so that's how that's how you like uh, you can inspire somebody without uh, directly uh, reaching uh, reaching out to one person in particular, right? Uh, from one to many, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah. So uh, you, you uh, anybody interested, you can just email us at tunacheki at gmail .com, Subject friends of Tunacheki. And yeah, uh, tell us about what you do, your channel, and we'll happily promote it. Awesome. Um, that's really useful. Um, so, okay. Um, you've got the, what was the email again? Friends at Tunacheki? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Tunacheki at gmail.com. Tunacheki at gmail.com. Yeah, okay. with, the, with the subject, Friends of Tunacheki. So we can just uh, categorize them. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Okay, so we're waiting for our next speaker to, to come on. Um, what would you say, so we've heard so far, we, we, for those of you just joining us, uh, today's call really is uh, the Sankofa Pan-African Global Summit. We're really trying to answer the question what it means to be a global African. And um, if you were here earlier to hear Professor Clark speak, he touched on some really salient points. Um, the really to begin to understand Africa's problems and so to solve them, we really have to um, have an extreme understanding or appreciation of our history. Um, and so Got Tabumi then picked up the button and talked to us what it means to be um, about global African citizenship um, and how that is based on values, um, and especially our shared identity and the values of equal worth. And so I see we've got Dr. So Timirin, um, thank you so much um, for your hospitality. Thank you. Um, for being on the call with us. We look forward to what you have to share with us. I must say, um, I, I love your outfits. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we do it to you. Shall we do so, it now? Yes, yes, go for okay. it. Great. Now, this poem uh, is going to be accompanied by a professional drummer whose name is Ifayemi Akiniyi. That's the name of this drama. And so, Africa, my Africa, Africa of proud warriors in ancestral savannas, Africa of whom my grandmother sings on the banks of the distant river. I have never known you but your blood flows in my veins your beautiful black blood that irrigates the fields the blood of your sweat the sweat of your work the work of your slavery africa tell me africa is this your back that is unbent this back that never breaks under the weight of humiliation this back trembling with red scars and saying no to the whip under the mid the sun but a great voice answers me impetuous child that tree young and strong that tree over there splendidly alone amidst white and faded flowers that is your africa springing up anew springing up patiently obediently whose fruits bit by bit acquires the bitter taste of liberty david dear that's the author thank you so much for listening bless you
Thank you. Um, Africa, who's back, is unbent. Um, and yeah, thank you for reminding us. Really, we come from a proud history. Um, we so often forget, um, but thank you that we have storytellers like you to remind us, really, um, because I think the time is now. There would have been a time when people would be ashamed or you know, try to distance themselves from the African heritage. I see that that time is changing. Um, those of you on the call, you might realize there's a Hollywood actress, I think um, her name, Tandy Newton. I think she's Zimbabwean. Um, and I think over the past few years, we've all witnessed a rise in our people, especially those in the diaspora embracing their history. Um, so she officially changed well, her name is Tandiwe, um, and but she'd been known as uh, Tandi. Um, but I saw recently that she changed her name back to the Zimbabwean spelling. And I, I see that um, pride in our roots, pride in where we come from. I see that returning um, to our community, especially those of us in the diaspora. So. Thank you so much um, for the work you're doing. Thank you uh, for bringing us the rhythms and sounds of the continent. I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to bring on our next speaker. I'm weary that we've been going on a while. Thank you everyone in the audience for um, your comments. Thank you uh, for, for staying on and bearing with us. Um, we have our next speaker is Dr. Marcel uh, in Bumalu. Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you. It's um, a privilege to have you. I don't think we, um, I think we need to, your camera, I think you're off. We're unable to um, make visual contact. Okay. My camera not good. Your lighting, I don't think we can see you. We can hear you clearly, but we can't see you as well. Okay. Uh, incidentally, I can see myself very well. I don't know. Okay. Maybe do I change my location or what? The lighting? Okay. Let's okay. let's see. Sorry. A moment, please. That's all right. That's all right. Um, we're just happy that you were able to, to join us. Um, so whilst... Is it, better? Is it better now? Um, I think let's make a start. I, I still can't see you. It might just be me, but um, oh, just have it. okay. Can can Doctor Bumi see me? Doctor Bumi, can you no, see me? I can't see you. It's just black, solid black. Wow, what's happening? But I can see. Okay, let me just shift a little bit, please, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we saw you when we started. Yes, I don't know what happened. Is it, is it better now? Is it okay? No. Um, no. It's okay. Uh, what do you think? Log, log out and log back in? Is that... I'm still not clear. Yeah. Maybe we can... Uh, whilst he's trying to sort that out, maybe Ms. Kerem can go on and then... And come on, yeah. Put out. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so um, Meski, I think yes. you're, you're, you're standing in the gap. Um, okay, I'll... perfect. Um, I just need the slides. All of... Tunde? Awesome. Okay. Okay, okay so great. great. Thank yep. you. Thank you so much to Dr. Bumi for organizing and Dr. Joseph for running through all this. And of course, we've had great speakers from Michael and George earlier. Um, so most of us are here because we love our beloved Africa. It's our beloved continent, right? Um, my name is Meski Wale, and I'm going to be speaking to you about a possible solution um, to some of the, the issues we've been talking about. And that's initiating and forming a movement, so a global movement for Africa. Um, currently, the movement is in its early planning phases, and planning will be done collectively. 
So inputs, ideas, and resources will be coming throughout, you know, across Africa and uh, uh, across the world. So people, both Africans and African allies, are welcome to um, participate. Initially, now and in the coming months, about 200 people will be asked, and then 300 organizations, businesses, universities, and religious institutions, and then eventually to be determined, maybe some governments, departments, uh, ministries, and agencies. Next slide. So the vision of the movement is to provide collective action and public service at large. So it's starting from the premise that we are collectively failing right now. So as we know, Africa has a rich history. We have beautiful family cultures. We have tight-knit community and tight-knit family, but we also have many internal and external challenges, right? So anywhere in most locations in Africa that we go, I'm here in Addis now, in a 30 kilometer radius, there will be people suffering in terms of lack of adequate um, food and uh, lack of shelter. So that's unacceptable. That's, we need to take responsibility, those of us with food, um, with, with shelter, and definitely those of us with internet. Um, like those of us here um, have. So um, the, the collective service areas um, is based, probably going to be structured under five collective service areas. And those are um, first global to local innovations. So as we know, we're lagging behind in innovation in Africa, but we believe that together we can advance in global to local innovations. Together we can also um, strengthen our technical expertise and training. Of course, building on African wisdom and cultures as already talked about earlier in this um, program is key because um, we have to know our own roots. We have to promote our own African uh, philosophies, our own African literature, um, uh, which, which we, we're so thick in, and our religious institutions to support them, in many cases, when we have failures in systems in Africa, our religious leaders are always there sacrificing for us. And then the fifth collective service area would be Africa, making Africa an impactful player in world affairs. Um, and, and the values, of course, we would do with love, honor, strength, but be open. I think an important thing is to be open to different ideas and beliefs and perspectives from a global African perspective, because we're, you know, we're, we're over a billion even on the continent. And um, to, to create unity, we need to have some type of openness and, of course, be in solidarity with all Africans and peoples of the world. Next slide. So some um, programs and then under that some projects that could be chosen, could be possible um, ideas for a, a global African movement. One is policy, African wisdom and culture program. Another collective service program could be the intellectual and learning program. Projects such as advancing cognitive abilities, developing critical and independent thinking, pro providing accommodations for persons with disabilities, promoting African ancient and contemporary philosophy and history, incorporating African wisdom and cultures in all African institutions and systems, researching, of course, our own um, history, because we don't, we don't um, have full research on that. We don't have full recordings on our philosophies, on our literature, and we're going towards other um, other literature, other philosophy, but we're not promoting our own. And then, of course, for our for our youth, critical, and for any any African any age to for us to advance as a continent is lifelong learning. And then also um, promoting all this globally. Next slide. Under the African wisdom and cultures um, structure, um, another two programs could be community program and leadership program. So our communities in Africa always keep us together. Um, it, it has for thousands of years, and it continues to do so today in the absence of other systems. We have our communities um, keeping strong, but maintaining those and strengthening the community ties, it can always be stronger. Um, could be a possible project, other projects, agriculture and pastoral communities who are doing so much work, you know, outside of our cities, they're 
they're really putting putting in a, a lot of effort and we, we really should be supporting um, our pastoral communities and our agricultural communities. Um, promoting sustainable communities, obviously climate change is going to be affecting Africa and the global south in a much um, worse way than it will the rest of the world. But for the whole, for our whole planet, um, we we need to start pushing for sustainable communities. And then African community networks and support systems, um, as other speakers have already talked about, are essential. Um, and then community focused education and empowering leaders at the community level. So developing leadership values, good values, we we usually we we usually refer to. Um, and then empowering leaders and strengthening leadership in terms of a leader, a sort of leadership program for Africans. Next slide. Um, lastly, under African wisdom and cultures, a communication program. We in one country alone, we can have eighty different uh, languages spoken, right? So we need to have our indigenous languages as official languages, but at the same time, ones that people are familiar with that we all we all speak. Um, and to facilitate communication, such as having online forums or using utilizing new technologies, um, for for example, in terms of uh, our you know the, re the possible religious program could be respect you know, a, a project respecting and supporting our religious institutions, and then uh, another promoting harmonious relations among religions in Africa, because again, that unity is key. Next slide. Global to local innovations, technical expertise and training is, is really, really essential. Um, after uh, not, why? Because right now just feeding people is not enough. We need to aim much higher than that. And we're not training our people. We're not training across Africa. We're not working in solidarity across the globe with, with other Africans. We're not, um, there's a lot of reasons. And if you watch Sankofa um, Pan-African series, you know, this is covered in full. Even yesterday, we're talking about the politics of hunger. Dr. Bermu was covering that. But we, we need that training. We need to provide for our, our kids and, and their kids. Um, which is not being done now. And of course, to, to advance in innovations because we have to keep keep up to date in 2022. So possible programs could be like a policy innovation, technical training program, capacity development program, capacity development being essential. Uh, again, we don't want handouts. You know, people don't want handouts. They want the tools to do things for themselves, for their communities, um, for their futures. And together, collectively, um, I believe we, we can do that as Africans starting now. And, um, uh, you know, there, there are many project options that can go under this, that can be talked about, that can be decided whenever everyone's putting their inputs. This is very initial planning, um, such as energy, transportation, urban planning, things that we, we lack, like sanitation, uh, waste management, water supply, agriculture, et cetera, entrepreneurship. Um, lastly, African World Affairs, the partnerships program um, would would also be essential because we need we need allies we need friends um, and there are people especially throughout the global south that have a very similar history to us in, in certain respects the ancient cultures but also um, it, just across the globe um, there there are good people who would be wanting progress in Africa and wanting change in Africa and and would would join together with us we can't always only I I personally believe we can't always only do things on our own but we are stronger um, as a people um, globally. Next slide. So if you um, have been seeing these slides on the top, there are uh, translations. So the language, um, there are translations in 14 languages. So the main languages were chosen based on official African language status, on the, num on the number of native speakers, on the historical significance and the existence of written script. So um, we have like two from Eastern to Northern, Western, um, and central and and southern um, and southern Africa, along with foreign languages, to um, reach out to those allies as well. And then, of course, the languages that are most widely spoken in Africa, um, some of which are also uh, foreign languages. Um, la why? So half of the side is divided into logo symbols and artwork. Why is this? Because to reach less privileged. Um, Africans and to to reach the working class, there are a lot of people who are illiterate, and we and and they don't have a lot of voice. We don't include them in 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 so many things, and, and this is one way in which we are to blame, right? So verbal and visual communication becomes key. Um, of course, 
the goal is always, you know, full literacy, but that will take time. And in the meantime, accommodating um, those less privileged um, Africans, I don't like the term less privileged or working class, but I'm just using it because that's the terminology that we use. Um, and, you know, artwork can be, you know, we can find creative ways, like there are ancient empires from Timbuktu to um, Great Zimbabwe to um, Aksum to Nubia, you know, there's so many, there's so many, um, there's so much rich history of artwork and symbols um, from interesting meanings to useful concepts um, to historical value, um, et cetera. Next slide. So participants, this movement is intended to be open to all who want progress in Africa, especially who care about collective action and public service um, to fix our shared failings. So organizations, businesses, universities, religious institutions are welcome to join um, across the continent and um, across the world. There will be different chapters, representation. Again, I brought up the working class and less privileged. Um, so I'm going to skip over the mediums and platforms, the tasks, monthly and yearly work plans need to be worked out. Lawyers will be consulted for all legal aspects and formal documents will be created in the coming months. Next slide. So the desired funding is in the millions because if this is to be a global African movement that focuses on communities, focuses on localities, but still um, is global, you know, we obviously would need really um, high sums in, in, in money to sustain it. Um, but no fundraising at this stage and in the coming months, no fundraising is desired until, you know, we get um, documents out to as many, as many Africans as possible um, and um, as many allies even as possible. Um, next slide. So I'm going to skip over this. This is just funding possible methods and the previous was um, also on, on funding. Um, but obviously there are a lot of different methods that can be used to, to fundraise. Next slide. So in conclusion, this movement is for you. It's for everyone who's listening, it's for all who love our beloved continent, for our fellow African brothers and sisters, for our friends and allies worldwide, and for all those who want progress in Africa. So the vision, again, is together we can make progress towards an Africa that is advanced in global, regional, and local innovations, an Africa that has strong technical expertise and training, an Africa that utilizes and builds on our historic and contemporary African wisdom and cultures, an Africa that respects and supports our own and other religious institutions, and an Africa that is an impactful actor in world affairs, which in many times, it, you know, we're not treated equally. We're not, we don't have those equal partnerships. Um, uh, of, of course, this is collective, right? This is collective action. This is public service in a non-traditional sense, which is it's coming from the people. It's coming from organizations and businesses who want change, who want progress in Africa, as the other speakers were talking about um, throughout this program. So as this is a collective action public service movement, again, all inputs, ideas, and resources from you, from the listeners in the coming months, um, in the early planning phases is, is desired, is key. Um, so please note, this is just a very initial um, presentation on early planning, um, but thank you for listening regardless. Um, my name is Mascar Mwale, and I'm glad to be here with my fellow brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Meski. Um, yeah, really important stuff. Um, really important work that you're doing. Um, a lot. We do need to collaborate, um, but I think you've got, you've got the. Um, let's just say you've got the blueprint. Um, a lot of our work um, needs to happen in stages. I'll be interested to. Just hear what, um, in, in terms of funding, where do you think that's going to come from eventually? Do you think this is going to be self-funded or are you, will you be looking to anyone and everyone, allies, anyone? But the reason I'm asking is because obviously from our history, we know what happens uh, when those deeper pockets fund um, our movement. Um, they get to dictate the time of engagement and priorities so how do you counter that yeah absolutely i mean you make um two excellent points actually so part of the reason we recognize and one of the reasons other than 
being global African talking about that is the need for a global African movement, right? And we, I mean, we can we can have a whole presentation on the issue of funding and dependency, um, and and what that uh, that that's a whole that's a whole thing. I I'm completely get you. However, um, I think one of the reasons I I really wanted to help initiate a movement is for Africans for us to take charge and for us instead to just start with the premise that we're failing, right? So funding, I think from, uh, if possible, as much as possible, grassroots funding would be essential. Grassroots, yeah, sorry, sorry, I had some people interrupting. Um, gr um, grassroots funding would be essential from Africans, but realistically speaking, we don't have enough um, funds coming, you know, everyone from our people, we're trying to live day to day, right? For, for a lot of us. And, but so we need allies, right? But even within Africa, there are businesses, there are small businesses, there are medium to large um, businesses, there are even the large enterprises, which are African owned, who, you know, who, if we um, show them that they they have a voice in this, this is our movement, it's our, our global African movement to bring them to the table. Um, the question of governments is unclear in terms of funding because there are government departments, agencies, there's some that are effective around the world, right? And even within Africa. But um, how that would be done, that's why I said to be determined, because we would have to have a lot of discussion um, falling under that. And then, of course, our religious institutions, um, any, you know, if, if they have any guidance, if, if there's anything um, that we, we can work very closely um, with our religious leaders, because of course um, most Africans um, care care a lot about our um, about our religious institutions, and so so to answer your question, Dr. Joseph, it's it's supposed to be open in funding because if we limit funding and say only um, individuals can donate, that puts us in a very tight box. That being said because this is run by Africans and will be run, it's, it's the people, it's not one person, it's not top down, it's going to be horizontal, everything we give is, you know, is going to be planned together. Um, it, you know, we can, we have to, it's just mandatory that we have to keep checking that um, there's no sort of dependency, there's no sort of strings attached. And that's on us, that's on how, how much we can do on our end. Um, to, to control that. And it must be controlled because, of course, if it becomes a tool for anything else, um, you know, then, then it has to be disbanded, right? Because we cannot um, participate in, in, in such a such a, such thing that causes dependency or, or anything like that. That's not the intention of a movement. And if it doesn't create, if it doesn't, it has to stick to our, our values, which I didn't really cover, but, you know, obviously love, honor, strength, um, uh, that you know those those strength is important because if we're afraid of whatever if we're afraid of dying even um, you know we can be controlled in that regard but of course honor being the key word because we're lacking honor in a lot of our systems now I don't need to get into details on that but um, we're just starting from the premise that we are failing Joseph yeah awesome um, I, I share I share I share that and I share the sentiment that you we do have to think quite broad. And if you dream of business gay, you know, dreaming big enough. I think someone said that to me a couple of times. So um the people who are commenting and saying they'd love to support. Um and if people want to do that, how will they do that? And before I let you come in, I'm gonna have to jump off. So if you'd kind of introduce the next speaker and then Dr. Boomer will take questions from the audience um, after that. But I'll be listening and it's just my, my, um, my batteries run out and I'm still at work. So, um, sure, so yes. if, Thank you. Thank if you so people much. were... You're a doctor and you're busy, so we, we get it. You no, know, you've been catching your, you know, your work, so thank you. So if people um, wanted to... Um, to to uh, I've seen terms saying I want to donate I want to um, help fund this how how would they do that thanks yeah um, so now we're in the planning phases please please um, reach out to me um, I I will respond reach out to me directly um, 
so my name is, you can see my name is Miss Garmwell. If you just, um, you can add me on LinkedIn, send me a direct message. Um, I'm sure we can talk to uh, Dr. Bumi about, uh, I can send my phone number and my LinkedIn and and, and email out. Um, my email is just meskywo at gmail.com. Um, again, meskywo at gmail.com, but I will leave that in the chat later. And LinkedIn is just under my name. So if you reach out to me, we're still in the planning phases funding. Um, that That is, of course, in the long term, but uh, very happy about that as always. But right now we need help um, in the planning. It's being sent out. Like we have brainstorms, we have documents that are being sent out. And as many people, especially people who are here today, um, who are interested in our cause, um, our cause is Africa, right? Our cause is African peoples and peoples around um, the world standing solidarity with them too in, a, in an equal manner. Um, you know, any planning that can come through, any ideas for the programs, for the projects, which are the next stages of the planning being done, um, please reach out to me and, and we will do this. We'll do this together. Our next speaker is Dr. Marcel. Um, he is the CEO and um, editor-in-chief of Prime, Media, Prime Business um, Media. So he's, he's just done decades and decades of work in editing and we appreciate him. So uh, please take it over. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Wally. I hope um, I'm, I'm being heard clearly now and the yes. uh, camera, camera is better now. All right. So first and foremost, I want to say a very big thank you to the organizers, um, especially the CEO, Dr. Bumi, for this um, very, very um, timely event. Um, I'm to speak on um, the African within the global system. Um, you know, a lot of, if we look at what is happening, the trend all over the world, um, there is this um, idea or this concept of globalization that has uh, been on for a very, 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 very long time. And then the idea of glo globalism, you know, taking the center stage in every sphere of um, our existence, even the media. I mean, about um, maybe 30 years ago, when you talk about the media practice, you're talking about local media practice. Right now, even community newspapers, community radios, everyone is hooked to the internet and everyone is playing global. So that concept of um, integration and bringing everything scheme of things, peoples, societies, governments, politics, everything, bringing them together, um, in integrating them called globalization. And then, you know, globalism being that spirit of, um, you, know, you, know, you know, of doing things with that global mindset, you know. Taking center stage, everything has changed. Business, the way we do things, the way we, we, we operate as Africans, you know, have actually been under, um, put to test and actually been challenged in several ways. But when you talk about the African as a global citizen, which uh, Dr. Bumi actually did justice to, you know, a whole lot of, um, a whole part, a, a very big chunk of, you know, most of the um, big chunk of what I want to talk about, I want to talk about here, Dr. Bumi actually dealt with it very, 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 very clearly. But then, if you look at Africa with 54 countries and um, obviously more than um, 900 languages, you know, it's the world uh, second, what's the second uh, largest continent actually, home to some of the most ancient of the world's civilization. You know, so when you are seeing globalizing activities, businesses and everything, Africa is actually not just the African, but Africa as a continent, and of course Africans, are actually um, a key, a company, a very important factor in that, you know. And um, why is Africa actually the one to preserve its own uh, culture, preserve its own um, values? Because Africa has got the right values. Uh, Professor Clark actually talked about, um, yeah, he talked about, um, Western imperialism, 
you know, a situation where you have about 15% of the world's population dictating actually what happens to the rest of the 85%, you know, and uh, Africa inclusive, you know. If, if you look at that, it draws me, it draws my attention back to the days when um, well, my grandmother in my own village in Southeast Nigeria, you know, was alive and um, then I was very small. Um, you could find, talking about values now, you could find um, the old woman who wanted to sell his ban her banana or her oranges or whatever. And he didn't need to, she didn't need to give it to anyone. All she needed to do was put the unit price of that banana or orange on the tree, put the, share the goods or the, whatever, the fruits there and then leave it. So every passerby would actually know that Okay, this is the cost of this. So by the time she puts it there in the morning, by the evening time she just come, she just came back to pack her money. None, everybody, no, everybody will pay the right price. Nobody's controlling it. Nobody's retailing it. And that gives you an idea of what the, the value system we have as Africans. So don't just look at the negative side. We do have the right values and all of those. So what are we saying? There are, uh, when you're talking about the Africans and global cities, we are coming from the perspective of our own, our local values, what we have as Africans. What That's what we're taking to the center stage. So we are bringing the right values. We are bringing the right, the right um, benefits when you talk about globalization and, um, um, uh, you know, globalism, you know, as it were. So now, talking about Africa, I will still come down to the African himself as a global citizen, but we are talking about now, what do you think, um, how was the perception that people have or the world has about Africa? The wrong perceptions that people actually have, the other part of the parts of the world, the West actually in particular has about Africa. You know, there are these misconceptions about Africa, you know, within the global space, you know, you know some right, others wrong, but really is about the wrong, I'm talking about the wrong perceptions right now. You know, one, there's this belief that Africa is poor and will forever be poor. Two, there is also this, that Africa, of course, Africa is a hot, dry and sunny all the time. Three, that Africans have little or no access to modern technology. Africa, you know, uh, to become developed and uh, must, before it, it, it can become developed, it must emulate the West in all things, culture inclusive. There's also this you know, perception that, you know, Africa's governance system is always bad, will always be bad, you know, and that everyone in Africa suffers, lives in mud house in the middle of nowhere. You know, I remember a, a time I traveled to one of the Western countries, I wouldn't mention here, you know, and, you, you know, a friend I met there was asking me, you know, where are you, where are you from? You're from Africa. Your country is Africa. And I was shocked. You see that you will be shocked that even today, most people in the West, most, um, uh, some Americans still believe that, um, you know, Africa is a country, not a continent. And that gives you the impression, the kind of perception they have about, because there's no proper understanding of Africa as it were by the, by the, uh, the larger uh, world, you know. So I spoke about that concept of globalization and glo uh, globalism, you know, which actually, as I tried to explain it, interaction and integration among people, companies and governments worldwide, talking about globalization. Why globalism actually it becomes just like the view of the world as a unit for business and political influence. So Africa, as I mentioned earlier, of course, is a big participant in, in this global agenda of globalization and um, globalism. You know, you, you could just see what is happening. You know, young Africans today, young Nigerians, young go to South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, all of these parts of West Africa. You know, they sit in the comfort of their homes and do global businesses. You know, becoming the world becoming a virtual space is become, of course, it's to the um, uh, benefit of of, um, of Africa as it were. So globalization and global globalism, of course, is the reason why U.S., for example, should be interested in Nigerian elections. You know, in Nigeria's security and in Nigeria's economy. You know, so now, of course, we know that talking about the global Africa idea, you know how it's 
actually came to be, you know, there are chronological contours actually of the global Africa idea. The idea that Africans and people of Africa descent worldwide share common historical experiences, you know, notably slavery, colonization, uh, colonialism rather, and racial oppression, and that they should therefore unite on the basis of these commonalities to effect their mutual liberation. Global Africa, of course, is uh, didn't just um, the idea as a concept didn't just start um, uh, today. Because across centuries, from 70, 1770s, uh, of course, about four phases. First phase being 1770, starting from 1770 to the 1900. Then you have the second phase from 1900 to 1945. Then the third phase from of, of this global Africa idea emerged in the late you know, 18th um, century, you know, in the era of um, abolitionism and the and and of the US, French, and um, Haitian um, revolutions. So which events are collectively called the quadripartite uh, revolution. So and then the global Africa idea then originated in the African diaspora on the west bank of the Atlantic Ocean, the Americas and the West Europe, as opposed to the east bank of the Atlantic Atlantic, which is Asia, or on the African continent itself. So in the second, third, and fourth moments, the global Africa idea spread from its base on the west bank of the Atlantic to the African continent and dispersed back communities, you know, in Asia and the Pacific. So this, the concept of Africa, that is global Africa as an idea is actually what I'm, I, I just talked about. But then you, you can ask yourself, who is a global African actually? You know, a global African, which actually brings us back to what the topic of today, what we actually uh, gather here for today. You know, who would you say is a global African? You know, is it someone who has, who just travel, an African who travels around the world, or an African who may not even have traveled out of his community, but has a mindset of global, globalization and uh, globalism? You know, so for me, I would say it's someone with African nationality, first and foremost, he, will have the Afri he or she will have the African nationality by birth or by naturalization. Maybe he might live in Africa or outside of Africa, but he is born, he has the nationality of Africa, one of the African countries, you know. So he has a worldview, someone who has a worldview that accepts the African culture as part of a global order, a culture of global inclusiveness. So that mindset, by my own definition, should um, match um, a global African. So primarily, primarily, the global African thinks on how Africa influences the world and how Africa is being influenced by the world. So how uh, does Africa you know, play or what role does Africa play in the global scheme of things? So that mindset and that view, that worldview, and that thinking about what, how the world affects Africa and how Africa could, or how Africa is affecting the world, you know, is what actually what makes you describe someone as an as a global African. So he or she sees the world as growing together politically and economically. So. Globalism is becoming an ideology where nations are constantly integrating while individuals are applying the concepts in their interpersonal and corporate you know, uh, dealings. So the African within the global system consists of attributes like culture, or I mentioned this earlier, culture, language, politics, economy, and technology. Um, one of the speakers here talked about you know, we having, you know, I think it's a um, Tuna Czech um, colleague there, he talked about, you know, um, Africa having its technology even before the Western technology came. You know, you talk about the Bini culture in Nigeria here, you talk about the Bini culture, you talk about even the Boku culture, look at the Nok culture and all of those uh, put together. You know, if you look at the craft, the art, the 
everything that we, we had done, even before the, the white man, men came to civilize, sorry, to colonize Africa, you would know that actually technology began in Africa. You know, there's nothing to show that Africans before the advent, before the coming of the whites, we are really backward and technological, uh, technologically uh, backward. No, every, you see inventions, look at the Egypt pyramids, look at the things, Egypt, for example, you know, you could look at the, the, the things, the creativity, the things they produced, things they carved, things they did, even before the white men came to Africa. How else would you describe that? Of course, it shows you that, um, um, that civilization actually started in Africa. So now, I have, next slide, please. But now I want to, I want to, if you look at, um, just to look at the way, the changing thing, how things are changing, how Africa, you know, the concept of global Africa is becoming like um, widespread. Of course, no one can talk about this. There's nobody talks about, you know, um, individuality, whether country-wise or, or uh, person-wise. You know, everybody's talking about how uh, he can play within the global system. But the important thing is why you are doing that, you actually have to, as a global African, you have to ensure that your, why your, your culture, your language, your everything is intact. You accept the changes, good changes in the global order while preserving the good things, your values, I mentioned earlier in the process. So I want, if you look at this slide, for example, Look at the ongoing World Cup, the match. What was the impression when you watched the match between Tunisia and France? What did you observe? You know, if you if you watch, it looked like a reverse situation. You know, French, the level players of France, we are all blacks. You know, whereas that was a Western country. That was, of course, France is Europe. Then you now have down here in Africa, Tunis, every all their players we are white. So it was as if <laughs> Tunis, Tunisia, we are the we are the West playing against Africa, the blacks, the France, that's France. So that tells you there's now a very thin line, you know. While we talk about, we no longer talk about Africa, we no longer talk about countries, we no longer talk about the world existing within the um, within uh, locations or things like that. So everyone is becoming a global citizen. So of course, that's why you, you commonly talk about Africa, a global African, you know, uh, playing in that, in that space. So culture and global Africans, I've talked about, uh, to an extent I talked about this, you know, Africans appear to have abandoned the wisdom and knowledge that their forefathers employed to sustain their traditional culture. I talked about, I gave an instance um, uh, with, the experience I had in my village growing up, where things, life was good, the value system intact, everything. So there, no one could tell that Africans are coming it, you know, to the table with um, with a kind of a negative baggage, baggage or something like that. No, we are bringing to the table good values to change the world, not to drop our good values to, to, to acquire the Western culture that could damage our own, our, our own, um, our own character. So, um, so I don't need to do so much on it, but if you look at the challenge, but we have a challenge, the global Africa has a challenge and that serious challenge, next slide please. Global Africa has a challenge and that challenge is in racism, you know, in race, next slide please, in racism, you know, if you look at, um, we all hear about Ngozi Fulani just recently, about a few days ago, you, about Ngozi Fulani uh, uh, saga, you know, where, you know, he, he was questioned actually about her background by Lady Susan Hussey, the Prince William's grandmother at Buckingham Palace. You know, the late Queen's lady in waiting has since resigned, of course, because Mrs. Fulani likened the conversation with Lady uh, Hussey in 83 to an interrogation. The palace described the remarks as unacceptable and deeply regrettable. And the spokesman for Prince William said, racism has no place in our society. Fulani, Ngozi Fulani was a guest at the reception representing domestic violence 
Brother Sarutti's sister, space. When she described Lady Huse moving her hair to see her name baggage, name badge, and then challenging her repeatedly to explain where she Are you, I know you are, this is not what we're, talk, we're talking about here, is actually a British citizen. But to the, to the lady, it doesn't matter. She's black. Her name is black. Everything about her is Africa. So why should she have a place there? So it's a challenge. While we try to, we're talking about globalization and globalism, you know, the challenge for Africans is racism, discrimination racial discrimination and um, hoping that um, so that's what we have to ask at, at our individual levels have to navigate against have to fight against have to and, and how do we fight against it by preserving who we are our integrity our culture our character you don't have to feel inferior you don't have to you know um, denigrate yourself to to belong to the global world is a, is a new core system whereby Africans will bring to the table their good values, their good culture, you know, to complement, you know, the good aspects of, of what the West and other parts of the world, you know, uh, you know, have. So I don't think um, we are coming to the table for this. So talk, coming to the table, you know, um, uh, deprived or coming to the table in, a, in such a manner that we are beggarly, you know, so, you know, by way of conclusion, I want us to look at, I just want us to have a think about the world melting into one small space and you know, making everybody one um, simple citizen of one global village. You know, what do you really think of these people? For example, do you think of them as global Africans? When you think about them glo as global Africans, what comes to your mind? Somebody like Elon Musk today, you know, South African, born in South Africa, he's an American, but born in South Africa, actually, actually grew up in South Africa. A substantial part of his life was in South Africa. You know, what do you think about Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie from Nigeria, you know, playing global, you know, the confidence she exudes and the rest, you know, Trevor Noah, South African, these are African, Ali Kudangute, a Nigerian, you know, the richest, Africa as we have today, you know, they are all Africans, global citizens of Africa. You know, Abi Ahmed, Ethiopian, when you think about these people, you see that we have really no reason to, to feel inferior as Africans. So as a global citizen, you are a first class citizen playing globally. If you're a Nigerian, if you're a South African, if you're an Ethiopian, if you're an Egyptian, if you are from Ghana, wherever you come from in Africa, you play you can play global and play global so confidently to the extent that in fact you you the west actually should play second fiddle not africa because africa is the beginning of life africa is the center of civilization africa began civilization africa sustains civilization as we speak africa will continue to invent civilization thank you very much i hope i kept to to my time <laughs> Um, Ms. Karen, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Bruce. Yes, I can just bring this on now. Pardon? Sorry, you, you broke up for a second. Pardon? Me? No, Dr. Bumi. No, 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 just uh, asking you to bring this home now. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mbamani. I, I think you threw some a lot more light on the on the discussion. So, no, Africa is the center of civilization and we are actually the first class citizens of the world. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Bumi. It's nice being here, and I'm very grateful for your invitation here. And God bless you for what you're doing for Africa. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you for everyone who's new to Africa, for everyone who loves our continent and is African. Um, Sankofa Pan-African series, please tune in all the time because I, I know I go to that for my information and to keep up to date. I know Dr. Marcel also does that. But I think the important thing that it reminds us is that we, we are the cradle of civilization. We have the most ancient empires. We have the most ancient languages. Um, you know, and, and, you know, to spread love. It's not like, okay, we're going to get I think, okay. Okay. Go on, Mascarin. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, but just, just to keep our pride intact and know that whatever stories we've been told, um, the, the ancient empires, there are empires. A lot of the religions, a lot of the first empires to adopt them were African. Um, and just to keep whatever you're going through, whatever country you're in, whatever continent you're in, to remember um, our African heritage is is beautiful. It's it's essential, and we we have our own ways. And that's not to say other other cultures all have their own unique, beautiful things about them. But thank you for orga organizing to Dr. Bumi. Thank you to the speakers, starting from Professor George to Joseph, who is keeping us intact. And of course, Michael from Tunicecki, always doing great work um, representing our continent. And thank you to the speakers. Please, let's keep in touch. Um, this, we from Prime Media to Sankofa to Tunicecki, you can also reach out to me directly and Joseph directly. Um, let's keep in touch and let's keep our brotherhood and sisterhood together. Special shout out to Zimbabwe and Ethiopia and Kenya. But <laughs> no, I'm just um, love to all. Love to all. Okay. Bye. You're muted, you're muted. Dr. Bumi, you're muted. Okay, so what I, I think one good thing that has uh, come out of this, uh, which should also be our follow-up, our call to action, is this movement that um, Ms. Kerem has taken the trouble to, you know, to explain and invite us all to be a part of. We can continue talking like this, you know, from now till kingdom come, but we need to have those concrete actions. We need to collaborate with organizations that are already on ground. I'm seeing um, uh, Garrick uh, Priog here. He's part of one of those kind of organizations that are already, you know, working, you know, towards uh, some of the issues, uh, achieving some of the um the objective that we've raised. And then let's all link up, you know. It's, um, nothing is too little. I mean, uh, if, your, your, if your contribution cannot be monetary, it can be ideas, it can be, you know, making yourself available, you know, to be part of this movement, you know, that helps us achieve our full citizenship as global Africans. Thank you everybody for, uh, for being part of this. I, I see a lot of uh, people who are already working in the area. Uh, I see Dr. K. Alabi, you know, I see, I see, I see a lot of um, um, Afro-Native world. Thank you, Langston Morrison. You've been here with us all along. Uh, Meta the Black, all of you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Heru, thank you. <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you to all. Thank you again. I yeah. echo that. Thank you. You are invited to this. Polarized politics in Kenya. Hi, everyone. I've had a number of messages from some of you out there asking how our children can have access to their history, stories, and biographies of great Africans and people of African descent in the diaspora. Well, I'm excited to inform you that we have launched SankofaStoryBooks.com just for that purpose. SankofaStoryBooks.com has a collection of fun Afrocentric bedtime stories and other exciting stories, nursery rhymes, and comics that showcase the rich 
cultures of various parts of Africa and the African diaspora. We also have early childhood education uh, curriculum and other resources for parents and teachers. Click on the web address showing on your screen right now. I'm inviting you to join us on this new adventure. Visit SankofaStoryBooks.com, sign up and subscribe to explore our amazing collection of children's stories. Some of them are even free. Don't forget, click on the web address showing on your screen right now. Polarized politics in Kenya. Zimbabwe's crisis deepens. 